whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon, it was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, a terrible discovery in the public toilets of a bus station. She went to the cubicle and um, struggled to open the door and then found this uh, scene of carnage, which is no exaggeration. A massive forensic murder investigation that spanned 12 years. Could be a really dangerous offender out there on the loose. And the finding of a killer where he was least expected. That scene of apparent normal family life and individual in full-time employment was absolutely not what I expected in this case. It's just one of them things that you cannot forget because it involved your community. This is Forensics Catching the Killer. Friday, the 7th of January, 1994, seemed like any ordinary morning at the busy bus station in the town of Bury, just outside Manchester. Amongst those arriving for the early shift was Paul Clough. He worked there at the time as an attendant. I arrived for work. We used to start um, all 600 back then. And I uh, met up with my colleagues, um, we couldn't get onto the station. It was all taped off, police all over it. Um, we didn't really know what, what had happened. We just, was police searching the bus station, so we figured something major's going on. It was several hours while we stood outside the station. We were just sort of diverting passengers and buses. To imagine the scale of how bad it was, um, I mean, you. you you won't imagine anything like this could happen in Berry. Also arriving to discover the disruption that day was Joanne Andrews, who worked in the bus station cafe. That morning, though, she was there as a passenger. I was travelling down south to see my now husband, um, and I was due to catch a train. My good friend rang me to say, you can't get the train, they've shut Bury bus station down. I then put the news on and heard there'd been a murder. I didn't know who it was, what had been involved, nothing had been released. It was just that Bury bus station was now closed to the general public. The terrible finding had been made some hours earlier. The body was discovered by uh, a young lady who'd uh, been clubbing in Bolton with a boyfriend and had come back to Bury, and she'd uh, nipped into the ladies' loo at 4.15 um, a.m. on the Friday morning. She went to the cubicle and um, struggled to open the door and then found this uh, scene of carnage, which is no exaggeration. When the police arrived, the toilet door was blocked, so they had to actually reach over the top of the cubicle and look down, and they saw the body of uh, an elderly lady her clothing had been removed. She was lying face upwards, 
and what the first officer noticed immediately was that um, the body had been mutilated and um, her right breast had been, uh, had been severed. As Greater Manchester Police began a massive murder investigation, staff arrived for work to find the entire bus station had become a crime scene as officers began the painstaking fingertip search for evidence. We didn't realise how bad things were, and when they were searching grids and bins, because we were watching them, they were like, you, you just thought there must be something major going on here. Because it's quite an open bus station, at the top of the station, it was taped across there, so we were sort of stood at the top end watching down, and because it's all glass, you could see the, them going through bins, you could see them like lifting the grids in the middle of the carriageway, things like that, so they are obviously looking for some kind of evidence. Again, we didn't really realise it was a bit of murder, but now you know, looking for a murder weapon. At the centre of the investigation was the elderly woman whose body had been found. She was identified as 66-year-old grandmother and recent widow Shirley Leach. The pathologist's post-mortem revealed the horrific extent to which Shirley's body had been mutilated after her murder. Her right breast had been severed by some kind of sharp cutting tool. Um, that breast was taken away from the scene by the offender and it was never recovered. Um, <clears throat> there were some scoring marks around the breast as well which had kind of parallel lines and there was a piece of broken glass found on the cubicle floor with some flesh around the sharp edges of the glass. So it appears that the piece of glass was, uh, was used initially as, as an attempted cutting implement. It would appear that that wasn't successful and according to the pathologist, the suggestion is that the breast was removed probably between half an hour to two hours after Shirley had died. Either the offender remained in the cubicle for at least half an hour before removing the breast, or he went away from the crime scene and then recovered something like a, a sharp knife. The pathologist was able to determine that there was an interval between death and the breast being removed. Um, because there was no blood at the scene. In terms of wider injuries, there was evidence of bruising around her neck and damage to the um, vagus nerve. So the cause of death was established to be manual compression of the neck, possibly by uh, vagal inhibition, which is pressure on this vagus nerve in the neck. So why had an innocent woman been so brutally murdered in such a public place? First, detectives had to piece together Shirley's last movements, which had led to her walking into that public toilet at that time. Shirley had gone two buses from home to uh, Fairfield Hospital in Bury, and Shirley had been there every night that week to see her daughter during the visiting time in the evening between 7 and 8. And uh, she then left the hospital around about 8 p.m. and had a, uh, I suppose, just a one drink at the nearby pub, and they had a Probably half an hour drink, then they caught a bus about 9 pm, the 469, back down, 10 minutes driving to ride into Berry Town Centre. When she got the interchange, the bus they'd been on had been delayed slightly, and she missed a connecting um, bus, the 474. Rather than wait, just standing around waiting for half an hour for the, um, the next bus, the next 474, she decided to nip to the ladies' loo. Had that bus not been delayed five or ten minutes, so uh, then uh, should have simply jumped on to the 474 and not use the ladies' loo, the ladies' toilet. And, uh, and that would have meant, of course, that she would not have been killed. In such a gruesome crime scene, much of the evidence needed had been left in situ. Forensic investigators moved quickly to retrieve the evidence. Subsequent analysis of the scene revealed that there was a a sample of what appeared to be um, tissue, sort of body tissue, on the outside of the toilet cubicle door. Through further assessment by experts, they were able to establish that after the offender had, um, had removed the breast, they'd left the cubicle. And in order to be able to get out of the cubicle, he'd had to pull the door towards him. And at that time, uh, he must have had the breast in his hand. 
because he'd left a uh, sample of the breast tissue on the outside of the toilet door as he pulled it towards him. Superimposed on top of the breast tissue was a rivulet of blood and that could only have been left there at the same time as the breast tissue because of the way it was actually situated on top of it. And it was from that rivulet of blood that they were able to develop a male DNA profile in the very early stages of the investigation, actually, in 1994. Murder cases like this are extremely rare. For that reason, there were so many resources devoted to it. But there could be a really dangerous offender out there on the loose, and that's why they devoted so many resources to it at the time to try and uh, identify who was responsible and to try and apprehend him to make sure that he couldn't do it again. In early January 1994, the small town of Bury in Greater Manchester was rocked by a terrible find in the public toilets of the bus station. In the early hours of a Friday morning, the body of Shirley Leach had been discovered. She had been strangled to death and then brutally mutilated. For detectives investigating the crime scene in such a busy place, the task was enormous with people coming and going at all hours of the day. The tram line went down to Altrincham at the time through the town centre. Not as extensive as the tram network is currently, but nonetheless, you had a lot of people travelling through Bury from across the Greater Manchester area. A lot of people on the interchange that night who all had to be traced and interviewed by the investigation team. The scene of a crime in a, in a public place means that there's an opportunity for um, bodily fluids, let's say, to be there that are, that are actually nothing to do with the offence that you're investigating. There are obviously objects in there. There might be cigarette ends, there may be litter, there may be food, uh, various things there. And of course, uh, at a crime scene like that, you don't necessarily know what is relevant and isn't relevant. And one of the first things is to recover what is there. There's a, a window of opportunity whereby you can recover material at a crime scene that you're not going to have once, it, once it's released. So in that first hour or two um, of, of an examination, you're going to want to recover everything that you can because you won't get a chance later on. Um, especially a public place at some point, eventually you're going to have to take the, the, the ropes down essentially and uh, allow people back into that space. In something like a public lavatory, it's also enclosed, it's a uh, tight space, uh, a cubicle, so there's a, uh, I can't have too many people in there, so there's obviously logistical problems of uh, doing a full scene examination. Despite being just half an hour's drive from busy Manchester, Bury was a small town, and used to seeing violent crime of this nature, and its residents, both male and female, had felt safe. Bury's probably one of the quietest um, divisions, the policing divisions in Greater Manchester, and that was no different in the mid-1990s, so that again made it such a, uh, a shocking crime, I think, for the local community, because they were just not used to having such serious crimes committed uh, within the town centre. Go out at night, used to go out with my friends, didn't have enough money to get a taxi home, so half past two in the morning I'd be walking home in my high heels. <laughs> but yeah, it was safe, didn't have any issues. And like Joanne, Shirley Leach had also felt safe at night. She had lived a quiet life, with time spent with family her main focus. Shirley was a widow, she'd recently lost her husband um, prior to being murdered. She'd been to visit her daughter in hospital on that Thursday evening. Very polite lady, no, no real enemies at all within the community. She had friends and, and relatives in the Brandlesome area of Bury. A very nice lady, really, 66-year-old grandmother who kept herself to herself. Paul Singleton had known Shirley since he was a little boy, having grown up on the same street just a few doors down. Shirley lived eight houses away from us, um, further down the street. Growing up as children, 
she had big bushes in the front of her house and we used to bounce off her bushes, you know, and get in trouble for that. She'd come out and shout at us. Um, she'd come out as well. I knew her husband, Ronnie. He used to do the garden with Ronnie, sit in the back garden on a beautiful day. I knew her because, obviously, she was a neighbour. She'd walk past, we'd stop playing football, and she'd go, are you lads, are you OK? And she was just a lovely lady, so she'd make sandwiches and bring them in the back garden for us, give us lemonade, and, you know, she was just a, a really nice lady. Shirley's death and the gruesome way in which she died shocked the town as a whole, and in particular, the small bus station community. Joanne Andrews was 25 at the time. There was a... Um... A cafeteria at the Bury bus station, um, right next door to the train station, and I used to do a Saturday shift there, and the odd occasion through the week when the staff were off or they needed cover. So, yeah, just a cafe girl. Joanne was at work when the cafe first reopened after the murder. Went into work. Um, we'd not opened the cafe at that particular point and we'd had a cup of tea and a meeting with the manager and the other girls who were on shift that day. And in the cafe, um, on the counter side, there was a hatch that we used to serve the general public to as well. We decided to keep that hatch closed because for our safety, this person was still out there. Um, we kept things very sedate. There was always one member of staff on the cafe floor rather than behind the counter because we, we didn't know what to expect. And it, it was nerve-wracking. Your mind's just a bit more sharper. Anyone who walks into the cafe who, who you've not seen for a while, you think, who are them, where have they come from, what are they doing here? You was questioning everybody's, you know, why they was there. There wasn't so many people around. You know, takings had dropped. The buzz of the cafe had changed. It, 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 the air was thick. Overnight, Berry changed to a place where local people were aware that there might be a killer in their midst. And if an elderly woman could be so violently murdered in such a public place, what might the killer do next? It was all the talk of all the pubs and the clubs, and, um, and certainly, you know, women uh, were, were being told not to go to the bus station on their own. Shopkeepers who did sell these personal attack alarms um, reported women coming in asking for them. We had a killer on the loose. We had, you know, we didn't know if we were local, didn't know if we were from out of town. For a very long time after that, well, like years after that, everybody was frightened, to be honest with you, because you didn't know if it was going to happen again. Knowing Shirley's murderer might strike again at any time, Greater Manchester Police faced an almost insurmountable challenge. The CCTV is quite unsophisticated then there's one camera on the bus station and they got a blurred image of a running man at one stage but the uh, the DNA remained the uh, the main the clue but there was one sighting of interest from another woman who had been at the bus station that night and she had reported it to police in the early stages of the investigation there was a sighting by a witness of a man behaving suspiciously on the interchange that night she was so concerned, she was due to catch a bus. She abandoned her plans to catch a bus and got a taxi instead because she was that worried after seeing this man. She was able to provide a, an e-fit of that man, um, which was compiled at the time. Because they had no starting point from the investigation, um, they looked at people who knew Shirley. I think they were able to quickly rule out any closer associates or relatives that she had at the time. Uh, it appeared to have been committed by a stranger, um, so they had no real starting point for the investigation. One of the main areas of focus for the investigation team at the time was people who'd been on the interchange that evening between certain points of time from sort of quarter past nine till quarter to ten. To trace all those individuals who'd been on the interchange and to try and eliminate them forensically by obtaining that sample of blood from them. The other main line of inquiry they focused on at the time was uh, known sex offenders in the Bury area who'd been arrested and dealt with for sexual crimes uh, in and around that period. There was one individual who had previous conviction for sexual offences in a bus station in Lancashire 
and it was established that he was actually on the Berry bus interchange on the evening of Thursday the 6th of January, so at around the time Shirley would have been present. Um, that individual was traced and um, DNA taken from him and he was eliminated scientifically. One year later, when Andy Meeks joined Greater Manchester Police, whoever murdered Shirley still hadn't been found. I used to walk around this area in uniform, so I know it quite well. The case was very much active. They had a DNA profile of the offender, so the team at Bury was still actively going out and taking samples of blood from potential suspects uh, all over the country, actually. So it was very much an active investigation. It was a very high-profile case. Lots of theories being um, discussed about who might have been responsible, where that individual could be uh, now, was the discussion at the time. Because it was such a horrendous crime, people were talking about, has the offender left the country? Is he in prison? Although investigators had retrieved a DNA sample from the toilet cubicle, which wasn't that of Shirley's, limitations in the available technology meant there wasn't much they'd been able to do with it. DNA profiling was in its infancy, without a doubt, in the mid-1990s. Um, the DNA profile recovered from the crime scene was a very early type of DNA profile. So there was no DNA database as we know it today. That DNA profile was only suitable for direct comparison against named suspects. If a named suspect was identified, they had to provide a sample of blood. They were invited into a police station where a medical practitioner had to take a uh, sample of blood with a needle. That sample would then be sent off to a laboratory for forensic analysis by a scientist. Some individuals had previous convictions for sexual offences um, who were on the interchange on the night, for example. Uh, however, when they eventually provided a sample of blood, they were eliminated. I know that some individuals refused to provide samples of blood, and because there was other information which suggested they were of uh, interest to the investigation, there, were, there was a small number who were actually arrested on suspicion of murder. Um, following arrest and I think and following consultation with the solicitors at the time, they were encouraged to provide a sample of blood, which they all did, and they were all eliminated forensically. Over 14 months since Shirley's murder and comparing DNA from 500 potential suspects, detectives were still no closer to finding her killer. But a major advance in the technology available to DNA profilers was just around the corner, and with it, everything was about to change. In 1994, we were just in the point of transitioning from the older technology to a newer technology. And the difference about that newer technology was um, it was actually a lot more sensitive, but the key point was that technology then gave rise to the National DNA Database in 1995. And the National DNA Database, effectively, is just a collection of people who've been arrested and had their DNA profiles put on. So this case actually was right on the cusp between the transition from the, the older technology to the newer technology. We knew at that point that the DNA profile that we had wasn't that of Shirley. Um, but obviously we didn't know at that time who it was. So the advent of the National DNA Database in 1995 obviously meant that you could proactively screen very, very many more people. So if we could do that, what we would then do is give the investigation team the ability to proactively screen tens of thousands of men who had come onto the National DNA Database as a result of being arrested for a recordable offence in England and Wales. And it wasn't for lack of resources or manpower that Greater Manchester Police still hadn't found the killer a year after Shirley was murdered. It was a, a very large investigation, potentially over 50 detectives working on it in total, including the major incident room staff. Um, there were over 12,500 documents completed as part of that initial investigation. Over 3,800 actions were, were completed by the investigation team, so this was a significant investigation. The murder sent absolute shockwaves through the community in Bury. Um, it was a really violent attack, clearly committed against a, a, a very vulnerable elderly lady. 
and the fact that somebody could have committed such a horrendous crime and still be at large caused a lot of concern within the local community and, and a lot of worry, I think, particularly in and around the town centre. But despite the new science and the hours spent finding and sampling people of interest, there were still no strong leads and the case went cold. In 1994, 66-year-old grandmother Shirley Leach was brutally murdered and her body mutilated in the public toilets of Bury bus station. A DNA profile thought to be that of the killer had been retrieved from blood found on the toilet door. But despite hours and hours of investigation and over 50 detectives working on the case, by 1995, it had gone cold. To the residents of the tight-knit community of Bury, though, the memory of what had happened to Shirley was still very much alive. The effect on the community for an unsolved murder is devastating, really, because you can't move on. You don't know whether you're safe. You're locking your doors more securely at night. You don't go out after a certain time. If you do go out, you go out in numbers. Even though it's so long ago, it's still really vivid in your mind. It's just one of them things that you cannot forget because it evolved your community. But no case is ever closed, and nearly 10 years later, Andy Meeks was setting up a new department for Greater Manchester Police. He knew there had been some major advances in the science of DNA profiling, and he was keen to use them. I was involved in establishing a cold case unit in Greater Manchester Police in 2004. We looked at a number of unsolved murder investigations in Greater Manchester and also a number of uh, undetected murder cases as well. The Sheila Leach case I had the personal interest in. I had a bit of um, responsibility to, to sort of uh, identify suitable investigations to, to conduct and I knew there was a DNA profile in this case and I was aware that new techniques had recently come online within the forensic service, um, which uh, enabled us to trial something called familial DNA searching, which I realized could give us an opportunity to identify the offender responsible for the Shirley Leach murder. Through familial DNA, investigators could search not just the offender's DNA on the database, but also that of their blood relatives. So although an offender's DNA might not already be on the database, a family member's might be. DS Andy Meeks was about to make full use of it. We applied to the Forensic Science Service for familial searches to be carried out. It identifies people who are on the DNA database whose DNA is similar to the offender's. And you're provided with a list of individuals who could be either parents or children of the offender or you get another list of people who could be potential siblings of the offender. The list that we got contained 6,500 names of individuals right across the, the UK. The objective is that you establish a family tree of that individual who's on the DNA database to establish relatives who are of the right age to be your offender. You then go out and obtain a DNA sample from those male relatives with a view to try to identify the offender and get a DNA match. We had 6,500 names. Clearly, it's not practical to go out and speak to all those individuals. So we applied um, filters to that list. So we started with geographical filters. Greater Manchester Force Area is the initial filters, and that provided us with a much reduced list. 225 people who could have been either a parent or a child of the offender and a list of 132 individuals who could be potential siblings of the offender. Again, science could only do so much. At the end of the day, in order to get to the right person, it, re it requires investigative work, police work. So if we leave aside the National DNA Database, which gives you a chance to proactively identify a suspect, 
the key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. So if the police get to the wrong person, you can quickly show that by DNA tests. We applied further filters to that and we identified initially those individuals who'd had the DNA taken in the Bury division of Greater Manchester. And it was that much smaller list that we worked on initially. And then the objective of that is to go out and speak to those individuals, develop a family tree to identify whether they've got any male relatives who'd be the right age to be the potential offender for the Shirley Leach murder. Um, and we'd actually started that process in the cold case unit. So I was out one evening in the Presswich area. I was speaking to individuals, trying to build the family trees with a view to identifying potential male relatives who could have been the offender. And then when I walked into the office the next morning, and I got a call from Scientific Support Services in Greater Manchester Police to say they'd received a match um, to the crime stain from the Sheila Leach murder case, which, you know, I think it was disbelief initially, um, excitement, but tempered with, you know, the need to identify this individual where he was living and to get him in custody at the earliest opportunity. There's a match with the blood left on the toilet door at uh, the interchange by Shirley's murderer. Then the police realised that um, they'd had a huge breakthrough. And that was to an individual who'd been arrested for drink driving on the 18th of February 2006, a subject by the name of Ian O'Callaghan. And by a strange twist of fate, Paul Singleton, who had grown up just a few doors down from Shirley Leach and her husband, also knew the suspect, Ian O'Callaghan. I knew Ian. He was a couple of years older than me. And Ian worked with me at uh, the company that we made the real furniture at. He was my shift supervisor at the time. Personal friend as well. He'd come into my mum's and have a brew. He'd be going for drinks together. We'd have a laugh together chat about his family and things that were going on. Got on really, really well with him, to be honest with you. Yeah, he was a really, really good lad. As part of that job, making road furniture, Paul and his friend Ian O'Callaghan had to use small but very, very sharp knives. We, we had to carry our gloves, we'd take them home, and the trimming knives. The trimming knives were used, obviously, to cut off the excess rubber around the cones and the raw furniture that we made at the time. We would take them home with us because if you left them, somebody would pinch them. Because, you know, if you had a good sharp knife, it was, it'd take you a while to, to get that knife into the position that it needed to be in. So, you'd, you know, you'd take it home, you'd take your gloves home with you. And, yeah, that was the, that was the thing that we used at work. Sharpening your knife all the time. That's one thing that everybody used to say, he's at it again, look at him. He's, he's, he's still trying to get it sharp again, look, look, look. In hindsight, the clothing O'Callaghan used to wear fitted with eyewitness accounts of the time of the murder and an EFIT picture released by police back in 1994. Ian was in the TA, so he used to wear an army jacket, sometimes army pants and army boots. Um, sometimes black trackies as well, he'd wear, wear black trackies a lot of the time, but majority of the time he'd wear an army jacket, a black bob hat, and he'd roll it up. He'd roll it up so it sat round with a rim like that similar to what was on the EFIT. But Ian O'Callaghan raised no alarm bells, either with his colleagues or the police. He slipped the net, even though he lived so close by. And he would have frequented that area on the night, possibly because he'd have gone fairly regularly during the week to uh, the nearby barracks um, in the town centre where the TA met. You, you, you do wonder if the police, bear in mind Shirley was 66, would the police have imagined um, a man of 25 would have some sort of sexual motivation? In March 2006, detectives at Greater Manchester Police had finally had a breakthrough in solving the murder of grandmother Shirley Leach over 12 years previously. 
Shirley had been strangled to death in the toilets of Berry bus station on a cold night in January 1994. But despite a DNA profile of the killer having been retrieved from the toilet and years of investigation, he had remained at large. Now, the cold case review team under the leadership of DS Andy Meeks have been told that a match to the killer had finally appeared on the National DNA Database. I don't think anybody ever gave up any hope of identifying the offender. I think there was lots of discussion at the time that the offender must be in prison, um, albeit there was a program ongoing at the time, I know, to take DNA from the prison population, so there was hope then that he might get identified. Um, there was other discussions around he must have left the country, he must have been locked up in some kind of mental institution, because the view was that it, for somebody to have committed a crime as horrendous as this one, they couldn't possibly be leading a normal life and, you know, holding down a job, living with family. Twelve years on, um, a man called Leonor Callaghan was driving his car through Moston in North Manchester and he was um, pulled by the police for um, suspected drink driving and was breathalyzed and routinely a uh, mouse swab was taken and then put into the national DNA database. He was charged with drink driving and was bailed. None were more shocked by who Ian O'Callaghan was and the life he was living than DS Andy Meeks and his team who made the arrest. This was an individual who was in full-time employment, who lived with his wife and young child um, in a, an affluent area of Bury. It's a nice part of Bury where he lived. Uh, we went round early in the morning at 20 past six, um, knocked on the front door. Uh, he came down and answered the door. Uh, he'd got out of bed, but his wife soon got up as well and um, came as a massive shock to her. He replied when he was arrested and cautioned, it's a mistake, and then he was taken off to the police station. But that scene of apparent normal family life and individual in full-time employment was absolutely not what I expected in this case. We conducted a search of his home address. We recovered a book from a bookcase which was entitled uh, Chronicle of Crime. And this featured a case from the 1960s where an individual had been convicted um, as a result of odontology. The bite mark in that particular case from the 1960s had been left on a murder victim's breast. And that's how the suspect was convicted because they were able to compare the dental impressions from him. So the theory that we had at the time was that the reason that he returned to the crime scene after the murder was in order to remove the breast because he'd left a dental impression, a bite mark on the breast, and he was trying to recover any evidence which might subsequently identify him as being the offender, armed with that knowledge that he'd acquired by reading that Chronicle of Crime book. In 2006, 12 years after Shirley's death, the trial for her murder finally began, and the prosecution had a number of lines of attack. The first was the uh, genetic profile and DNA evidence that from the blood left on the back of the door. And the jury was told that there was a one in a billion chance that the DNA um, profiling um, would not be his. The second um, part of the case, the prosecution, was that they had a, um, a police sketch they made just after the time of the murder when a witness came forward and described a man they'd seen. They found O'Callaghan's passport at the time, and the two pictures were very similar. The prosecution said there's an 80% um, similarity there between the two, which is part of the jigsaw in a way. And I think O'Callaghan actually agreed that they were similar, but he never met Shirley Leach. He'd never been to the bus station that particular night. And police had discovered since arresting O'Callaghan that his past wasn't quite as clean as his nice family life of recent years might have suggested. In fact, he'd been convicted of previous sexual offences dating as far back as his teens. And a recent change in the law meant that these offences could now be presented to the jury. Previous to the trial in 2006, the Criminal Justice Act had been amended uh, to allow what they called bad character evidence to be 
introduce into a trial if the judge agreed to it. And in this particular case, uh, the prosecution applied for um, evidence of O'Callaghan's previous uh, criminal history to be included, as long as they were of similar types of crimes. But because he'd had some um, previous convictions involving um, indecent exposure and uh, indecent assault on the lady uh, whose house he'd broken into when he was a 16-year-old, uh, the jury were allowed to hear that. You know, put that together, the DNA, put it together with the, the photo fit likeness, then the jury were pretty well convinced. The jury took just four days to reach a unanimous verdict of guilty. When he was convicted, um, he was led away and he shouted, um, I didn't do it. There's no admission made, and the judge actually did remark on the fact that he never shown any remorse whatsoever. And he was sentenced to life with a minimum to be served of 28 years. But the trial for the murder of Shirley wasn't the end of the story for Ian O'Callaghan, and it transpired that she wasn't his only victim. Not only did he have previous convictions, which came to light after his arrest, for indecent exposure and assault, yet another woman came forward to report a crime committed against her by O'Callaghan 10 years after he murdered Shirley, and at a time when he had taken a job that put him back at Berry bus station every day. In 2016, a woman of 26 who lived in Berry came forward and told the police that she'd been uh, attacked and raped by O'Callaghan as a child. He was then a bus driver. He finished a shift in Berry and then was walking home. He saw the girl who he'd known from previously. He once exposed himself to her. He attacked and he brutally raped her and threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. So then he was uh, re-arrested in prison and uh, interviewed and again denied it, showed no remorse. And then stood trial at Minchell Street Crown Court in Manchester and uh, was convicted of raping her. He was then told he would um, probably never be released from prison. Again, he never showed any remorse for either of his crimes and uh, has never admitted them. Although she was only a child when O'Callaghan attacked her, this new victim to come forward had something in common with Shirley. Both were attacked in public places where they felt completely safe and by a very ordinary man. How could anyone be so savage and evil and cruel? But the fact that he actually mutilated her, strangled her, and uh, it was just something that, that I, I could never forget, really. And uh, when I went to the Crown Court, I was fascinated to see what this guy looked like. What would he look like? Um, and he, he, he just seemed so ordinary, and it's hard to believe that he could have committed such a, a violent um, act.